the system we're seeing right here is in chemical equilibrium, and we can see that the value of K is about 1.5. It's about 60 Bs to 40 A molecules or moles per liter, if you like. If we set the system into a situation that's not in equilibrium, we know that it's going to evolve toward equilibrium spontaneously over time. This is what chemical systems do if they're in a non-equilibrium state. Reaction occurs in the forward or reverse direction until they reach equilibrium. So for example, if we start off with 100 A's and 0 B's, it's pretty apparent that the system is going to spontaneously shift in the forward direction. The reaction will proceed net in the forward direction to produce more B. And this is particularly pronounced if we add some heat to get the molecules over that barrier. In this video, we're going to introduce the quantitative idea of evaluating a system in going from an initial state to an equilibrium state. What this will give us the ability to do is, given a set of initial conditions, we'll be able to determine equilibrium concentrations given an equilibrium constant. This will also allow us to calculate the equilibrium constant if we know something about the initial conditions and equilibrium conditions. In this video, we're going to learn how to organize this process using an organizational device called an ice table or a rice table, and we'll see the broad conceptual idea behind the ice table. It is a bit algorithmic, but there's a lot of important conceptual underpinning here that we want to keep in mind. For example, the comparison of the reaction quotient to the K value to assess whether a system will go forward or backward. So this video is all about equilibrium calculations. So let's talk about the basic problem, the basic situation here. Let's imagine that we had a general reaction, little r molecules of r goes to little p molecules of p in a non-equilibrium initial state. And non-equilibrium means that the value of the reaction quotient Q is not equal to K. And for the purposes of this example, let's assume that the initial Q value is less than K. This means that the forward reaction will occur spontaneously since Q needs to increase, the concentrations of products need to increase, and the concentrations of reactants need to decrease, and that corresponds to reaction in the forward direction. Now, in proceeding in the forward direction from the initial state to the equilibrium state, some number of reaction events or reaction occurrences take place. And we typically measure this in moles because it's a very, very large number in absolute terms. We're going to give it the variable x. This is the number of reaction events between the initial state and the equilibrium state. And if we know the value of k but don't know the equilibrium conditions, we don't know what this number is. And the goal of equilibrium calculations is often to determine this number, and then from that number, we'll use stoichiometry to determine the amounts of reactants remaining and amount of product produced, for example. Now, from stoichiometry, we can reason that as the reactant disappears, for every reaction occurrence, negative r is the change in the molecules of R, since we lose little r molecules for every reaction event. So the total number of R molecules lost is negative R times X. Similarly, on the product side, since little p molecules of P are made with each reaction occurrence, the change in concentration of the product is positive P times X. And in the green box here, we see an example of this setup. So if we start in an initial situation where Q is less than K, indicating that the reaction is going to go forward spontaneously, well in that case the change in M2 molarity is just plus or positive X because there's an implied one here, so we get one molecule of N2 for every reaction event. We get three molecules of H2 for every reaction event, so its change is positive three times X and we lose two molecules of NH3 for every reaction event right here, which is why its change is negative two times X for X reaction events from the initial state to the equilibrium state. And you can imagine if the reaction was running backwards, if we just entertain that hypothetically, the change in N2 molarity would be not positive X, but negative X. And the change in H2 molarity would be negative three X, and the change in NH3 molarity would be positive 2x. So we can see how the comparison of Q to K has a big impact on the signs of these changes in concentration. So comparing Q to K is critical in equilibrium uh, calculations, and that's an important lesson of this slide. Now, 
that's kind of a lot of abstract math and it's a lot of, to keep track of if you have for example more than one reactant and more than one product involved it's not so bad for two species but imagine we had say you know two reactants over here and three over here it gets complicated quickly this is why we use a device known as an ice table to organize things an ice table lists the initial conditions and these are often given in equilibrium calculations on the first line the very first line is the reaction. Let me back up a little bit. Including the reaction is critical because we're going to need to use the stoichiometric coefficients, little r and little p, to determine what to put on the change in equilibrium lines in particular. So some people will call this a rice table to emphasize that, yeah, you know what, the reaction's got to be on there as well. Okay, so initial conditions, first row, or second row, if you like, of the ice or rice table are listed right here. And these are concentrations. These can also be partial pressures, right, since we could work with pressure-based reaction quotients and pressure-based equilibrium constants just as well. The change line lists the change in concentration of each reactant and product. And to assess this, and in particular to assess the sign, whether the sign is positive or negative, we need to consider the reaction quotient and its magnitude relative to K is Q larger or smaller than K in the initial condition. So specifically Q sub I, the Q in the initial conditions is what we need to compare to K. That'll tell us whether the change on the reactant side, for example, is positive or negative, and then the changes on the product side will have the opposite sign, right? Which is why minus plus is written over here and plus minus on the left. Those signs will always be opposite. Uh, one thing, uh, one more thing I should mention about the change line, we're going to multiply by the stoichiometric coefficient for that species. And this is related to that stoichiometric idea we discussed earlier, that for every, for X reaction events, let's generalize it out, for X reaction events, we're going to gain or lose R times X molecules of the reactant, and we'll lose or gain P times X molecules of the product. So then, at equilibrium, we simply add the initial and change lines, reasoning that the final situation, well, that's the initial situation plus the change, right? And so we take the initial R concentration and add or subtract Rx, depending on the sign on the change line. We take the initial product concentration, add or subtract Px, and or subtract or add, if you like, Px, to get the equilibrium concentration of P. And we can do this for any number of reactants or products in the ice table. At this point, we know the equilibrium concentrations in terms of X, but X is still a variable. And to solve for X, to get a value for X, we need to know the value of K, the equilibrium constant. And in problems where we're interested in the equilibrium conditions, the value of K needs to be given. Often, I'll write the equilibrium equation right at the beginning of the problem, or at least the reaction quotient, now is a good time, just as good a time to write it. And what we're going to be able to do now is plug in the equilibrium concentrations from the ice table into the equilibrium equation. This idea of products over reactants with each concentration raised to the power of its respective stoichiometric coefficient. So in general, we'll start out with the general version. K is equal to the equilibrium concentration of P raised to the little p power divided by the equilibrium concentration of R raised to the little r power. And now we can substitute in those expressions on the equilibrium line of our ice table. And this is going to get the equation, an equation where x is the only unknown. One equation, one unknown, we're going to be able to solve that somehow, some way. Now the math can sometimes get complicated once you've plugged in everything, but the basic sort of general idea that we can solve for x at that, this point still holds. So here I'm substituting in initial p concentration minus plus p times x, and that's raised to the little p power. That little p exponent, which is here, actually, let me do purple, comes from the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation, right? And little r comes from the little r in the balanced chemical equation. So in the denominator now we have the initial R concentration plus minus R times X. That 
whole equilibrium concentration raised to the little r power, where that little r comes from the stoichiometric coefficient in the balanced chemical equation. So on principle now, we have an equation with one unknown. X is actually the only unknown because K is a number. K will be given in problems where we're interested in the equilibrium conditions. So now we can solve for X. And after solving for X, it's quite common to have to plug back in to these expressions on the equilibrium line to find, for example, the actual numeric value for the equilibrium molarity of P or the equilibrium molarity of R remaining at equilibrium. 